Today's scripture reading will be uh, Colossians 2, 1 through 3. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church of Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lies hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Thank you for being here. Appreciate the presence of all of you. Only got one visitor's card, Ron and Jarvis, and I know that there are more than that as I look around. Appreciate all of you being here. <clears throat> Bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can be here to get, again to uh, serve you in uh, worship and uh, to commemorate the death of our Savior at the Lord's table, to take of these emblems to remind us of that priceless sacrifice that makes heaven possible for us all. We're so thankful for the songs that we have sung to you and to one another, and we pray your blessings upon the spoken word today. We are mindful, dear Heavenly Father, of those that are not with us today. There are many. We pray your blessings upon them that they in turn will be able to be back with us uh, real soon. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our hearts for the reception of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The other day I was reading a bulletin from um, one of our writers for the daily devotional, and, and he had a little excerpt in that bulletin about uh, things that uh, Jesus did not or can't be found in the Bible, and and I started thinking about that, and I thought, well, there are a lot of things that people think is in the Bible but aren't there, and I also thought there are some things that might surprise us that are there, so I put the lesson together, and this is how it's going to come out anyway. Uh, some of the things that you might think in the Bible that are not there is three wise men. Uh, we read in, in Matthew 2 that, that the Magi, or wise men, came from the east to visit the baby Jesus. And um, ultimately, because perhaps three gifts, they figured there were three, three men there, but there were only wise men. And we have no idea whether or not one brought the same thing. Um, as one of the others, or there were duplicates, we don't know. But once again, three wise men isn't there. Have you heard the expression, moderation in all things? Do you think that's in the Bible? We hear it all the time, moderation in all things. Of course, it's good advice, but that did not come out of the Bible. Now, that originated with Aristotle many years ago. Uh, the Bible does teach us uh, self-control and moderation. And I use that expression, moderation in all things, because it's the balance that Scripture seeks. Um, and uh, I think that that reflects a biblical idea, but uh, it's not there. What about this? The Lord works in mysterious ways. It is not in the Scriptures, folks. It's in a song. It's in a hymn, and that hymn was written by William Cowper, who lived in the 18th century. And uh, certainly it reflects a biblical truth that God does work in mysterious ways. And I use that expression because it's very common, but we cannot say that it's out of the Bible. There is, of course, Psalm 139, verse 6, where the, David says, Such knowledge is beyond me, far too lofty for me to reach. And that's a modern translation, uh, that it's beyond me. 
Now, have you ever heard the expression, the window, the eye is the window of the soul? Some people think that's from the Bible. It's not from the Bible. Although in Matthew 6.22 it says, The lamp of the body is the eye. There's no reference saying it is the window of the soul. And there's no consensus as to the origin of this statement. Uh, but some attribute it to a proverb of varying origin and others, uh, uh, and others to several writers including Shakespeare and Milton. Now, have you ever heard that uh, Adam and Eve ate the apple in the garden? The apple in the garden. Uh, we don't know what fruit was on that tree, but it doesn't say that it was an apple. You can read Genesis 2 and 3, and you'll discover that it is not described as a particular fruit. Um, and, and yet the apple grew out of a Christian tradition, and it may have been based upon an artist's uh, depiction of it. And uh, some say it was a uh, pomegranate, but that's about as good a guess as an apple, isn't it? Now, a fool and his money are soon parted. Have you heard that expression? Some people think it's in the Bible, but it's not. There's it, not even close to a biblical reference. And this comes from Thomas Tusser, who wrote it in 1573 in the 500th Pointus of Good Husbandry. <laughs> now, of course, maybe this is practical wisdom, and, and, it, and it certainly is uh, common that a fool will lose his money. But it's not a biblical statement. Well, what about this? This too shall pass. How many of you use that? I bet you all of you have heard it or used it one time or another. And once again, it is not of Christian origin. It comes from a Persian Muslim poet sometime in the Middle Ages. The only way this can be true is if it includes death as being the terminal illness that will certainly pass away. Uh, but this too shall pass um, is not a biblical statement. What about this? Have you heard money is the root of all evil? Well, that's a misquotation, but yet we've heard it said so many times that we think the Bible says money is the root of all evil. Actually, in 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, The love of money is the root of all evil. And actually, the article does not end there, and the King James put it in there. And so, literally, it says the love of money is a root of all evil. And so, it's, the problem is not the money. The problem, obviously, is the love of it. Well, have you heard this expression, charity begins at home? Yes, we've heard that, but once again, it's not a biblical statement. It's credited to Terence, a of, um, of Roman, uh, Roman comic writer. And it sometimes is attributed to Sir Thomas Brown, who wrote the phrase in 16, uh, 1642. Well, maybe you have heard this expression and thought it comes from the Bible as well. Spare the rod and spoil the child. I am sure many people have used that as authority to spank their child. But that's not in the Bible either. Um, actually, it's a paraphrase of Proverbs 13, 24. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Obviously, the rod can be symbolic of any form of discipline that a child is, is given as a result of misbehaving. And so the key word is discipline. And uh, to say that that simply means that we ought to all uh, use a belt on our kids like we were when we were small uh, is, is not biblical at all. Well, here's another one. To thine own self be true. Well, it comes from Hamlet and Shakespeare. In a bit of context, the quote reads, This above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Not bad advice, but it's not from the Bible. And finally, well, there's two more. i got to share this with you. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I am sure we wish it was in the Bible. 
uh, because um, the, the Mosaic law is very clear about cleanliness and hygiene. Unlike, uh, you know, unlike a lot of societies, uh, the, the Jewish society were really concerned with bod- bodily cleanliness. And, um, but there's no source for this um, statement other than some say it comes from a second sem- century rabbi. And we know the first English version comes from Francis Bacon. And so it certainly is good advice. But here is a statement that I think you may think is in the Bible more than the others. The Lord helps those who help themselves. It's probably written by Jean de La Fontaine, a French poet and writer of the fables in the 17th century. And it became a political slogan in 1824 to encourage the middle class to resist the government. And in many ways, the phrase is wrong because God helps or saves those who cannot save themselves spiritually. And it's perhaps a half-truth. We don't sit down at the table and pray for our daily bread, expecting manna to come from heaven. So we know that when we say, give us this day our daily bread, we're looking more for opportunities to earn that bread or to make that bread, correct? And uh, certainly the Lord has helped people who are incapable of helping themselves. Um, but um, uh, to say that this, this is biblical is not correct. Now, but there are things that Jesus said that might surprise you coming from him. And so this is in the Bible. In Matthew 19, uh, you might want to turn over there and uh, read some verses with me. Jesus said, sell what you have, give to the poor, and follow me. This is the story of the rich young uh, ruler in Matthew 19, uh, 16 through 26. And um, as a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, the beginning of the church in Jerusalem, there were so many needy people there who stayed after the Pentecost. They didn't go directly home because they were converted and they had to stay and be taught so that they would know what to teach people in their own homeland. And so they had no way of earning any income while they were there. They probably ran out of money. Have you ever gone on vacation, ran out of money? I have. I had, when we were shortly married, I had to borrow money to get back home. I'm sure they were in that situation. And, um, and so uh, the people sold what they had and they gave it gave it to one another but if every christian did this we would all be in poverty if we all sold what we had and gave to the poor and we couldn't support one another and there would be no source of encouragement from christians because they wouldn't have anything either and so this particular teaching is just an illustration of how we approach scripture this man was a greedy man who thought that he had done practically everything, coming to Jesus probably for more compliments than any advice, and said, what thing could I do uh, to earn eternal life? Excuse me. Jesus says, keep commandments. He said, which ones? Jesus rattled off a bunch of commandments. He said, I've done all that from my youth up. What do I lack yet? Again, this man seems to want Jesus' approval and commendation. And Jesus said, you lack one thing. If you want to be perfect, you sell everything you have, give to the poor, and follow me. Because he was extremely rich. And the man went away very sorrowful for that reason. He was not willing to part with what came before God. So... The moral of that story is, if you put anything before God, you are not going to be blessed by God in eternity. Here's another statement that surprised some people that's in the Bible. It is in the Bible. 
He says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. Throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. Now Eusebius, who wrote in the 4th century, the first church historian said that the church father of the 2nd century, Origen, actually took this literally and he mutilated himself. I don't think Jesus meant that we should literally uh, do this because he's saying basically anything that is causing you to sin, you should take drastic measures to sever yourself away from that. And the reason why I think that is that he doesn't say poke out both eyes. He doesn't say cut off both hands. A man with one blind eye can just sin just as much as a man with two eyes. A man with one hand can sin as much as a man with two hands, right? So what he's saying here is not literally be taken because uh, you literally apply this and the person can continue on lusting or stealing. What he's actually saying is you've got to take drastic measures to end your sin. Not physically, but you've got to do something about it. In other words, if you have a drinking problem, you've got to take drastic measures and get all the liquor out of your house. That's cutting a hand off. If you have another problem, you've got to get rid of it. Get away from it. Distance yourself from it. You know, you don't buy your ice at the liquor store if you're an alcoholic. You've got to make common sense Drastic decisions to break it off. That's all he's talking about. Here's something that may shock you. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says you got to hate your parents if you want to be my disciple. Whoa, are you kidding me? Yes, it's in there. Let me read it. Luke 14, 26 through 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus was known to use a shock treatment on people. He used extreme rhetoric, hyperbole, to get his point across many times. Let me give you an example. In that passage in, uh, about the rich young ruler, afterwards Jesus told the disciples it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Do you see the hyperbole, the exaggeration for effect there? Jesus did that all the time. And so here in the sense of using hate, it is to jar us to the reality of what discipleship really means. Matthew, uh, writing probably after Luke, uh, sort of tones it down and he says this, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew gives the commentary of what that hate really means. But Jesus used the word hate to really get the point across that if you put anything, any loved one, anything above me, you can't be my disciple. And so he says here in Matthew, let me continue on. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so he's really saying when he uses the word hate, he wants to jar us to the sense of reality that we cannot put anything before God. And the hate is used figuratively. And certainly this would not be in keeping with Jesus' uh, command that we should honor our parents. <coughs> in Matthew 10, 34 through 36, Jesus says, and this is sort of similar to what we said about hating our parents. He says, I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. Wow, that sounds like it'd be right out of Muhammad's uh, Koran, wouldn't it? 
I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Our Prince of Peace, who says, I am come to give you peace, not as the world give, I give I to, unto you. Well, notice what he says. In Matthew 10, 34 and 36. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her, her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies, and this is the key, will be the members of his own household. Now, Christianity began among the Jews. And can you imagine a Jewish daughter marrying a Christian? Or a Jewish son marrying a Christian and causing the havoc in that Jewish home? We have a parallel today in the Muslim world. If a Muslim daughter converted to Christianity, isn't that creating havoc and basically a war in that family? And so the conflict is exemplified or declared by the example of the sword here. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And so families have disowned their own who converted to Christianity. And Jews treated Christians in the first century the same way the Muslims are treating Christians in their, their land today. This sword is not a literal sword, but the sword of spiritual conflicts that becoming a Christian often creates in the home. Finally, well not finally, but pretty close. Jesus told the disciples to go buy a sword. Notice in Luke twenty two thirty six, he said, But now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. Jesus was sending his disciples out into the world. In Matthew 10, he didn't tell the disciples to go buy a sword because he was teaching, the disciples were teaching Jews. Jews teaching Jews. There was no need for a sword. But as the disciples would go out into the Roman uh, Empire, they would run across bandits and robbers and thieves and, and people wanting to do them harm in many ways in their travels. And so Jesus says, you go out and buy a sword. And so, but in Matthew five thirty nine, didn't he say, resist not him that is evil? Yes, he did. Resist not him that is evil. Is there a contradiction here? Actually, the verse goes on to say, But whoever smites you on the one cheek, turn to him the other. This is not a life-threatening situation. Nobody's going to die by having someone slap them in the face. It certainly is an indignity, but it certainly isn't a life-threatening situation. Jesus is not talking about someone trying to take our lives. He's talking about our overreacting to a situation. Even the law says that, you know, if somebody uh, slugs you with their fist, that does not give you the right to pull your gun and blow his brains out. You will be charged with murder if you do, because there's got to be a proportional response to that situation. And so Jesus is basically saying, yes, you should defend yourself, but make sure you don't take the law into your own hands. And that you should not just be provoked with any, any minuscule type of uh, provocation. If somebody slaps you, of course, there are other people who if you slapped them, they'd kill you. Jesus said, you don't retaliate that way. It's best to suffer that indignity for the cause of Christ than to do something that you'll always regret. Now, finally, and this is the tough one, Jesus says, unless you eat 
my flesh and drink my blood. You have no life within you. Now, during the severe persecution of the church in the second century and third centuries, Christians were accused of incest and cannibalism. And the incest, incest obviously came from hearing people preach that you need to love your brothers and your sisters. And to the evil, all things are evil, correct? Titus says that, Titus chapter 1. And the Lord's Supper that we uh, t- uh, heard uh, Gary talk about. This is my blood. <coughs> Excuse me. This is my blood, says Jesus, referring to the fruit of the vine. And the bread, he says, this is my body. Take and eat. And so the uninitiated, the sinners, would hear that, and they believed that they were guilty of cannibalism. And so in listening to this passage of Scripture, it has often been misunderstood. Let me read it to you, if I can. <clears throat> John six fifty four through 69. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught. Therefore, many of his disciples, when he heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. I think we'd all agree. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? Well, then, if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before, it is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who it was that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come unto me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. As a result of this, it says many of the disciples... (coughs) <coughs> withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. <coughs> so Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. <coughs> I'll make it through. I just got one more paragraph here. On October 13th, 1972, a twin turboprop airplane crossed the Andes Mountains carrying 40 passengers and five crew that disappeared and were not found. These were athletes, and all were presumed dead. But 72 days later, 16 emerged alive to tell their story. Their survival depended upon eating the flesh of their comrades who had died as a result of the crash. One can only imagine the desperation of these people who were starving to death. Although highly abhorrent to us, you and I really don't know what we would do in similar circumstances. Staring death in the face, people do desperate things to stay alive. And this is Jesus' point. We must realize that we are staring eternal death in the face. There's no hope left but one, and that is Jesus. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood is symbolic of the desperation we feel at being lost and knowing that Jesus is the only one that will save us out of this horrible predicament. It is the shedding of his blood 
that we are reconciled to God. Let me illustrate it this way. I've shared this before. A man came to Buddha, Gautama Buddha, and said, what must I do to live forever? And he took the man down to the river, and he took him down, and the man, assuming he was going to go through some ritual washing, and he grabbed the man, and he threw him under the water, and he held him under the water. Here he began to kicking and kicking and kicking and squirming and trying to break loose. And finally, just before he drowned, Buddha brought him up. And the man gasped for air. And Buddha asked him, says, when you're about to drown, what were you thinking about? And he was gasping and said, air, air, air. And he said, when you want the answer to that question as badly as you want, wanted air, you will find it. Mark Twain once said, it's not the difficult things in the Bible that bother me. It's the ones that I understand. And coming from an agnostic, I think that's quite significant. We've dealt with some things that might surprise us that are in the Bible, but underneath, underneath it all, we come to understand that what Jesus is saying is this living in this life is serious business and we're not any of us going to get out of it alive. Meanwhile, what are we going to do with our days that we have? Once again, if we put Jesus first and eternal life is a desperate issue for us, we will be his faithful children. And this is what he wants. Thank you for listening to the lesson this morning. I've enjoyed presenting it to you. And um, some things are very interesting. Probably some things were quite boring. But the bottom line is that being a human being is a serious thing because of sin in our lives. And there's only one solution, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's not an option. He also said, if you believe that I am he... You'll live forever. He also said, unless you repent of your sins, you'll perish. He also said, if you confess me before men that I am the Lord, he will confess us before our Father who is in heaven. And he also said, you must be born again of the water and the spirit. And that's why he said in Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Where do you stand today in relationship to your Lord? Are you desperately seeking his approval and acceptance. We're going to sing a song, and we hope that you would respond. Let's stand.